As doctors, it's our duty to provide our patients with the best healthcare possible. But what do we do when our patients resist our recommendations? Despite decades of research and proven efficacy, vaccinations have come under attack by the anti-vaccination community. Not only has this endangered individual patient lives, but it's also endangered the well-being of our global society. Today, we're talking to Dr. Julie Gerberding, an internist by training and also the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as the CDC. Let's hear Dr. Gerberding's take on this. Thank you so much for joining us on Dot Loss, Dr. Gerberding. It's my pleasure. What role do vaccines play in eliminating both the national and global health disparities? You know, if we look historically, there really hasn't been a modern intervention that's had more impact on global public health than vaccines. We could start with smallpox, but also fast forward into measles, polio, um, and many, many other conditions. So they still remain an incredibly powerful force of health and health equity. There are certainly improvements in economics and productivity that have occurred as vaccines have been introduced and child survival increases. Probably measles vaccine mm -hmm. has had the biggest impact in that domain. In countries that have widespread measles immunization, we see child survival improving. And of course, that leads to lower birth rates and overall economic progress. So the U.S. government works with a variety of different people from different backgrounds and perspectives from which arose the war on vaccines. In a position of global leadership, what approaches do you recommend to promote messages of public health practices in spite of this controversy? You know, I think we're in a world where we're having a big debate between science and belief. Our social media is accelerating our awareness of that and probably the diffusion of that conflict, but it's certainly not originating it. This has been a problem ever since vaccines were invented. Mm -hmm. So we really have to stand strong as scientists and as clinicians, start with the data and the evidence, but also remember that most people aren't scientists. Most mm -hmm. people respond to their feelings and what's in their heart. So we have to do a better job of translating that science into a more humanitarian approach to understanding where people are coming from, um, telling them the stories of value in ways that aren't about data and quantitative science, but rather about feelings and hope for their children. What advice would you give physicians and medical students who may face resistance when recommending vaccinations in their daily practice? You know, one of the things I learned when I was at CDC is that the person people most want to get their health information from isn't some government official it's from their doctor. There still remains a very strong trust in pediatricians, family practitioners, and the overall primary care physician. So I think the doctor and the patient environment needs to stand strong, mm -hmm. not let all of the facts and figures get in the way of the message, but rather start with the message. I'm your doctor. I know this is a tough decision. Lots of good parents like you struggle with this, mm -hmm. but I have a long history of being in my shoes, and I know that vaccinating your child is really the very best thing you can do to help protect their future. More and more people inside the health system are actually recognizing that health is created outside of the health system. What happens in the hospital or in the acute care situation is important for a specific problem, but actually the genesis of health is in the home, in the community, in schools, and in the places where people live and work and play. And if we don't engage ourselves in advocating for those kinds of policies and those kinds of priorities, we don't really have much hope of being able to move the needle on the health dial in a positive direction. So you advocate a position of empathy and respect for that perspective, but still pushing public health practices. I absolutely do think we have to start with where the patient is and really listen to the, in this case, the parents, understand what are their, what's the foundation for their fears, but also not be afraid to be authoritarian. We are the experts. We do know the data. We also know all too well what happens when we fail to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. Amalgamating your extensive experience in both the public and private healthcare sectors, what advice would you have for current or future leaders at the CDC? I think, first of all, it's a privilege to serve at the CDC. It's a fantastic organization. It's a complex organization. It's as broad as it is deep. It is the front line of health protection in the U.S. and beyond. And I think the new coming CDC director just needs to spend a little bit of time really listening and learning, mm -hmm. but always lead from the science. You know, good science is necessary for good policy. 
it's not sufficient, mm -hmm. but it's definitely necessary. And a CDC director has to go deep into the science, but also be prepared to translate that in, that science into policies that make sense in a pragmatic way. That's hard for scientists, mm -hmm. and we like to be purists, and we think if we have the science right, everything else right. should automatically follow. But in fact, policy is very complicated. It really is political. It's mm -hmm. balancing the perspectives of many different stakeholders and constituents who see things not always in the same way as mm -hmm. we're well aware of today. So I think the CDC director has to understand the various points of view and then try to knit them together in a pragmatic policy position that can actually get somewhere. I also think it's really important to pick your battles. Mm -hmm. um, you can't win every battle at every point in time, but you can win the most important ones. Mm -hmm.